Welcome everybody and thank you for joining this joint seminar. We will have five jurisdictions to be discussed. So I'll uh, suggest so to start immediately. I will take the floor for Italy. The aim of this presentation is to tell you a little bit about what the Italian Competition Authority is doing now with a view to try to predict what it will be doing next in the near future. Before delving into this topic, I take advantage of being the first speaker today to put on the table a more philosophical issue concerning the role of competition law in time of crisis. In this respect, one may argue, on the one hand, that since companies are already suffering because of the crisis, they simply can't bear the weight of fierce competition among them. There will thus be a need for a relaxation of antitrust standards for less competition law enforcement. On the other hand, however, it is precisely when small players and consumers are more vulnerable that a competitive environment must be preserved most, this resulting in turn in more competition law enforcement. So you see, this crisis situation leads us into a paradox pursuant to which at the same time we will need more and less antitrust enforcement. An additional layer of complexity is then represented by the fact that competition law in time of crisis needs to be applied to a situation deeply characterized by uncertainty and by a strong imbalance of power among market players. I will come back later on this concept. That said, let's see what the Italian Competition Authority is doing right now. Leaving to my colleague Giacomo the point on cooperation, which is a typical example of less competition law enforcement, the first noticeable aspect is that in this last period, the authority enforcement action consisted basically of a lot of intervention for consumer protection. These had been done within the framework of the unfair commercial practices. These interventions were in particular aimed at tackling misleading information and accessing pricing conducts and were carried out against ruthless companies which were selling alleged cure for COVID, some as even as more as modern doctors do come out, were trying to sell miraculous cure all products. And the companies were also opportunistically gouging prices for essential supplies, like uh, food stuff or pharmaceutical, for instance. Another interesting aspect is how the authority actually intervened. In most of the cases, indeed, it did so by adopting interim measures, which was a tool seldom used before by the Italian Competition Authority. These interim measures in practice consisted of the shutdown of a number of malicious websites, orders for the deletion or the correction of misleading information, or for the complete and immediate stop of the unfair practice. The authority also proposed a creative interpretation of all tools by widening their scope, showing in particular its willingness to use consumer legislation, again, I'm talking about unfair commercial practices, to tackle excessive pricing which normally has been dealt under the much more demanding framework of the abusive, abuse of dominance. Finally, the authority relied upon another even more unprecedented tool, the blanket request for information. These requests for information, very wide, very precise, were sent not merely to obtain information, but specifically to coerce companies into compliance. In practice, this request would say, look, we know that you did this, this, and this, tell us more about that, and the company will feel some, somewhat forced to say, yes, we did that, but we are going to fix it. Coming now to what the authority will do tomorrow, next slide, uh, from the attitude shown and the specific public statements made by Italian competition authorities, we can tell that, and I will focus for the interest of time on three main points, uh, we can tell that the authority is first interested in avoiding the emergency, that the emergency legislation passed in this period could permanently undermine competition. The authority did so by acting through its moral suasion powers. Second, the authority was willing to rethink market definition. In this respect, the authority acknowledged that, as an old Italian saying goes, in time of crisis, there are those who cry and those who sell handkerchiefs. This means in practice that while there are companies that are still striving today for survival, other companies manage to reap in the same period incredible profits. The idea of the authority is to address this imbalance precisely by revising market definition. Finally, uh, the authority received in this period a lot of complaints. These complaints are probably ripening right now, so we can expect in the upcoming months or week a revamping of antitrust enforcement. Giacomo, close is yours. Thank you, Patrick, and good morning to you all. 
As Patrick was correctly pointing out, the Italian Competition Authority has been an active enforcer and a vocal advocate for competition over the past few months. But in addition to these roles, it has also been a much needed guide for undertakings. And indeed, following the approach adopted by the European Competition Network, by the European Commission and by several other European competition authorities, the ICA has published its own communication on cooperation among undertakings during the COVID-19 crisis. The goal of the communication is to temporarily provide undertakings with a clear set of rules in order to allow for a certain degree of cooperation aimed at ensuring the constant production and distribution of essential products and services in order to tackle any potential shortages. In particular, the communication foresees that in order for any cooperation to be allowed, the measures proposed by the undertakings need to be temporary, proportionate, and most important, necessary which means that they have to bring about efficiencies for the production and distribution of such good, goods and services. Now, given the circumstances, clearly the main focus of the communication is the healthcare and pharmaceutical sector. However, the authorities' interventions are not limited to it. And indeed, of the two comfort letters issued so far, while one deals with the cooperation for the distribution of single-use surgical masks, the other concerns the approval of a common moratorium scheme for consumer credits. These two comfort letters are interesting because they provide useful indications as to the approach followed by the ICA when authorizing such limited cooperation. So first of all, while the communication on cooperation explicitly states that it only applies to um, con Italian competition law, the cases at hand concerned the entirety of the national territory, thus they might have had an impact on the EU internal market. And for this reason, the Italian Competition Authority had no problems in consulting with the Commission before allowing such cooperation. Secondly, both cooperative schemes foresee an important role of trade associations. On the one hand, the trade associations of Italian pharmacists, and on the other hand, the trade association of Italian financial intermediaries. The role of these trade associations is that of independent third parties in charge of ensuring that no anti-competitive conduct takes place under the cloak of the COVID-19 emergency. And lastly, with particular respect to this last point, the ICA has put a great emphasis on the need that no sensitive information are exchanged to an extent broader than necessary, requesting in particular the Financial Intermediaries Trade Association to keep track of and store all exchanges occurred in the context of the cooperative scheme so as to be able to review them at a later stage. Uh, this is so because the ICA has historically adopted a very tough stance vis-a-vis -vis information exchanges, often considering them as full-fledged cartels, so restriction by object of competition even when they could not have possibly been such. Another sector in which the ICA has been particularly active, uh, next slide, is that of uh, merger control. And this is true despite the fact that the authority had to abide by the suspension of all administrative deadlines from, May, uh, from February 23rd to May 15th, meaning that, at least on paper, all filings submitted to the authority over this period would have been deemed to have been filed on May 16th. As a matter of fact, however, the ICA still reviewed every transaction notified to it, although at a slower pace. And in carrying out its merger control duties, all can be said about the ICA except that it has been slacking. As a matter of fact, at the stroke of May 16th, just like an antitrust Cinderella kind of story, the authority opened a phase two review of the proposed acquisition by Intesa San Paolo, the main Italian banking group of Ubi Banca, which is one of the top five Italian banks. Now, the opening of a phase two review is already big news in Italy, but in this case, the authority went one step further, carrying out don raids at several branches of the two banks. This is a doubly exceptional event. First of all, because don raids in merger cases are almost unheard of. And secondly, because the fact that the ICA was willing to launch one under such particular circumstances shows that now, and in all likelihood also in the future, the authority is willing to apply merger control rules very strictly. Now, this concludes our presentation uh, on Italy. So thank you very much for your attention. If you have any question, please drop us a line. I leave the floor now to our colleague Maria from Quatre Casas, which uh, will provide us with some insights on Spain. Thank you. Many thanks, Giacomo. Now, uh, it is well known that the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdown measures have been particularly harsh in Spain. 
This has, of course, created a lot of uncertainty for company and has also affected the application of European and national competition law. In particular, the Spanish competition authorities had recognized the need to adapt to the current economic and legal context. However, uh, in parallel, they have also uh, made it very clear from the beginning that they will continue to rigorously and vigorously enforce competition law. And in fact, they have done so during the hardest month of the pandemic and will continue to do so in the aftermath. Uh, to give you an idea, the initial reaction of the National Commission on Markets and Competition, the CMC in Spanish, was to issue an statement uh, reiterating its traditional position of zero tolerance for any and all anti-competitive behavior. And in line with this, already in the early days of the crisis, the authority launched a dedicated electronic mailbox to centralize complaints and consultations related to the application of competition law in the context of the COVID-19 outbreak. This mailbox works in parallel to the regular complaint mechanism that was already in place and the very successful leniency program in Spain. And it has been reported that the leniency applications were actually made even during the lockdown. In about uh, two months, nearly 500 queries and complaints have been received from individuals and companies in relation to alleged anti-competitive behavior, mainly in key sectors such as health, uh, financial services, and uh, the marketing of basic goods. And following up on these complaints, the CMC opened several preliminary investigations that are currently ongoing in the banking sector, uh, the insurance sector, and in relation to sanitary products and funerary, funeral services. Uh, it is also interesting that in addition to the traditional cartel and abuse of dominant prohibition, the CMC is also looking into possible violations of Article 3 of the Spanish Competition Act. This article prohibits distortion to competition caused by unfair trading practices that harm the public interest. This seems to allow the CMC to prosecute a wide range of conduct that could qualify as abusive behavior, even in cases where there is no a dominant position and uh, as long as the public interest is affected. Now, that requirement does not seem like a big hurdle given the circumstances created by the COVID-19 in Spain and uh, take it into account the previous decisional practice of the authority and the relevant case law in this area. On a different note, uh, it is also important to keep in mind that next to the CNC, there are also regional competition authorities in Spain. And some of them have always been very active and remain very active, uh, such as, for example, the Catalan Competition Authority or the authority in the Pay Basque. These regional uh, competition authority also have inspection and sanctioning powers. In any event, the main uh, conclusion or takeaway from all this information is that we expect new investigations in many different sectors in the coming months uh, and after the lockdown. For example, sectors that are already on the scope of the authority are sectors in which an important source of revenue is public procurement, including health and research-related research industry, construction or transportation. And here I would like to highlight that uh, the CMC created a specific unit to detect anti-competitive uh, conduct concerning public procurement, and uh, that has been very successful and led to the opening of several cases. Another thing to keep in mind is that since last year, the competition authorities in Spain are seeking that companies found guilty of bid rigging are banned from contracting with the government. Another focus are online sales, platforms, and algorithms, where we already have an ongoing investigation. Uh, these are also uh, on the radar and will probably be the focus of more scrutiny, given the increasing importance and uh, the new consumer patterns that have developed during the pandemic. Finally, uh, the last point on this is that in light of the large, uh, large number of complaints and ongoing investigation, we expect that the on-site in inspections will be shortly resumed as companies begin to get back to normality. So our general recommendation to business is to prepare for this and, for example, to review their internal protocols in case of down rates uh, to adapt them to the new circumstances. So moving on to the next topic, 
Um, in line with the European Commission and other competition authorities in the EU, as we just heard, the CMC has qualified to some extent its traditional strict position vis-a-vis -vis cooperation between competing companies. And it has as well shown its disposition to allow in exceptional circumstances and on a transitional basis, certain cooperation agreement between competitors aimed at, for example, solving the production or distribution problems caused by the pandemic. In that regard, the CMC is largely following the criteria set out in the temporary framework published by the European Commission last April. However, the authority has not issued any formal declaration of inapplicability to any specific agreement, which it could have done and it could do on the basis of Article 6 of the Spanish Competition Act. Instead, the CMC chose to resolve the specific queries in an informal way through both written or verbal guidance uh, via email or phone calls. And this approach has proven to be very constructed and, and quick in practice, as it recently showed in relation to cooperation agreements in the health and insurance sectors in Spain. We believe that the need for cooperation agreements will continue during the economic recovery. And as a result, of course, the CMC will remain vigilant regarding this type of agreements in the aftermath of the pandemic. And this brings me to my uh, conclusion on this point slash warning. It, it must be very clear that this flexibility will not apply to all forms of cooperation and information exchanges. For this reason, our recommendation is that cooperation scheme, even those sponsored or encouraged by the public authorities, must be subject to a careful uh, assessment in advance. And to conclude, uh, very briefly, a few points on merger control in Spain. First, uh, we expect an increase in M&A activity post-COVID-19 in Europe in general, and more in particular, an increase of distress M&A in Spain. This will probably lead to a process of business consolidation in the medium term, especially in those sectors more, uh, most affected by the economic uh, crisis. Second, Spain is a jurisdiction on which you should always keep an eye, as there are two alternative notification uh, thresholds here, a turnover and a market share threshold. And this is, of course, very relevant in, an, in any multi-jurisdictional assessment because a transaction can trigger a notification obligation in Spain, even if the companies involved do not have physical presence in the country. Third, it is important to note that gun jumping cases appear as a priority for the CMC in its action plan uh, for 2020. So be careful with the obligation to suspend the implementation of the transaction as the authority has allocated additional resources to pursue this type of infringements. The next point I would like to make is that on the substantive side, the CMC usually performs a very strict analysis of a transaction and may be reluctant to apply the failing firm defense contrary perhaps to what we have seen or we will see in other jurisdictions. And finally, please keep in mind that the Spanish government has recently introduced a mechanism to review foreign direct investment on ground of public policy, public security or public health. And this can uh, delay certain transactions and be an extra hurdle to take into account. And uh, that was it about Spain. Now give the floor to my colleague in Portugal, Pedro. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Maria. Uh, well, the, the the scenario in Portugal is actually quite similar to, to what we uh, have heard about Spain and or Italy. Uh, so in the, in the very beginning, I think that the authority was really uh, concerned about uh, the effects of the pandemic, the probably the need from for some sort of cooperation. But then and in, in the end, as and as we will see, an infringement is still an infringement, and and I believe that uh, the authority is not actually uh, uh, making uh, a significant effort uh, to uh, well uh, to give some slack uh, as as regards possible infringements, and will it will happen the same as regards merger control? But in fact, in the end, well, they signed a joint statement uh, uh, regarding uh, ECN. But uh, 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 immediately after, they published several recommendations alerting and, and uh, uh, companies that uh, the authority would 
be very vigilant uh, as regards possible infringements during the pandemic. And as we will see, uh, in fact, uh, uh, there were some, some very interesting decisions during this last uh, uh, couple of months. Uh, so I think we'll, we'll go uh, move to next slide and, and start. Uh, uh, I would like to give you a, an example as regards the enforcement activities. So we saw recommendations to associations like, like uh, similar to what happened in, in Spain or in Italy. Uh, sectors are exactly the same. But I think I will focus for a minute in, in uh, something that, that was well, new and it's actually quite related to the pandemic, which is this interim measures on uh, a, a no, regarding a no poach agreement uh, on professional football. This is interesting because, well, it's, it's not very common to have interim measures in Portugal. And the, 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 I think the, the importance of the case is that, uh, and, and I'll spend a minute with this, football clubs agreed that for, for the, the championship, uh, well, to occur in a, a more peaceful way uh, until the end and in the course of the pandemic, uh, each football, football, football club would not try to hire uh, football players from other uh, clubs. Imagine, Befica would not try to hire uh, a football player from uh, Porto. And the authority immediately adopts uh, 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 interim measures saying, well, you have to stop this. And uh, uh, despite the pandemic and despite the reasons that, that you are invoking, uh, well, the championship was frozen uh, due to the pandemic, and and, and uh, now was just starting uh, uh, for for a, a few weeks uh, until the the summer. Despite the pandemic, what the authority was saying, well, an infringement is still an infringement, and uh, and I will go after you if if I have to. So they opened proceedings, and uh, it's interesting because we are talking about. Uh, 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 the, foot, the Portuguese Professional Football Association, which means that the authority may go after the association, uh, the members from, from the, the, the governance bodies. Uh, and the most important thing, I think, is, is that uh, to calculate the fine, uh, the, the Portuguese Competition Authority will have to, to consider the aggregate turnover of uh, all uh, associates, notably all the major uh, football club. So it's an interesting case because it happened just a month ago uh, uh, amidst the, the pandemic and uh, uh, despite the argument that well this is a special context that could justify uh, the no poach agreement the authority didn't uh, uh, accept it and let's see how it ends. Uh, uh, then uh, what we have is also recommendations to pharmaceutical uh, association regarding um, uh, alerting the association uh, as regards possible excessive pricing or other conduct during the, the pandemic. And the same happened uh, with the, the banking sector and consumer credit sector uh, regarding renegotiation of credits uh, or, or uh, other kind of commercial measures. So they, they are very alert and vigilant as regards cooperation. And well, uh, our recommendation is uh, don't don't believe that the pandemic may justify any uh, infringement because it will not, and the authority will will go after the the company. Now, going going further and and looking at merger control, uh, uh, we'll see that uh, uh, the scenario is, is exactly the same. So uh, there was a well uh, a slow start uh, in the beginning of the year and uh, and the early March and then April. Actually, all, all deadlines were frozen, so judicial and administrative uh, deadlines were frozen. So it, it, we could, one could expect the authority not, not to, to uh, uh, run merger, merger control as it used to, but that, that wasn't the case. So we, we had several, uh, uh, almost two dozens of, of new uh, transactions filed uh, and cleared or, or ongoing during the pandemic. But uh, what, what I would like to highlight is this last topic, one gun jumping decision. This is quite interesting because actually it was a gun jumping decision against an hospital 
during uh, uh, the pandemic. So uh, apparently the uh, one hospital was acquiring another hospital uh, and uh, they didn't file the transaction. So it was not subject to prior uh, uh, notification or clearance. And therefore the, the authority opened proceedings against the hospital uh, uh, for gun jumping. And so it's interesting uh, because the, the hospital was fined for gun jumping uh, in March, so we were in the in the in the peak of the pandemic, and of course it is an hospital, and they need the money. And the, what we saw was was the authority saying, well, given the pandemic, we will allow uh, for the payment to be uh, 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 done in several installments. And another interesting uh, thing related to to this is that sometimes we discuss, well, do do we think that because of the pandemic um, companies will be able to uh, present a failing firm defense or because in fact we, we will have a lot of uh, acquisitions uh, uh, of, of well companies facing uh, uh, pending insolvency or, or uh, difficult situations well and it's interesting because in, in this case the hospital was acquiring another hospital that was in fact facing uh, uh, a pending insolvency and the result of this acquisition would lead to a market share higher than 50%. And the, the, the authority cleared the merger and, and clearly is stated that due to the pending insolvency, uh, it would not block uh, uh, the merger uh, despite the high market share well and the, the horizontal overlap. This was uh, uh, occurred in a, a regional market. And in fact, uh, the the acquire will have a very uh, significant market share. But it's it's uh, interesting because at the same time they were finding the hospital during the pandemic uh, for gun jumping, and at the same time they were uh, well uh, accepting not well exactly the failing firm defense, but they they were sensitive to the fact that the other hospital was was facing insolvency, and because of that, and despite the high market shares. The, this would not lead to to a, uh, a, a provision decision. So it's interesting. Uh, to wrap up, what what I would say is that as as we saw um, regarding Spain and and Italy, especially Spain, the authority in Portugal, while we, is uh, I'm, I'm pretty much convinced they will continue to. Uh, 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 investigate all sorts of infringements and um, based on, on the evidence that we have and based on these uh, 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 decisions that that uh, that were taken during this period, uh, we sh should not expect the authority to, well, uh, uh, not go after companies just because of the pandemic. So even if we're talking about cooperation or uh, information exchange, or, or uh, it must be really well justified in order to, to uh, uh, comply with the applicable rules. And the same will happen as regards magic control. So, yeah, so they, they are very active. They have a, a task force that was created just to investigate possible uh, notifications uh, uh, that, that were not filed or gun jumping cases. Uh, and and because of this, we think that well, actually, this is business as usual. And the the trend here is that when we look, for instance, at uh, last year data, we saw that the the authority imposed almost 400 million euro in uh, on, on, on fines uh, regarding infringements. So we, we don't expect the authority to slow down. Actually, so we should expect uh, uh, several investigations, COVID related, in the near future uh dawn rates and this is interesting to to better understand how will dawn rates take place uh uh in this uh, specific context and as uh, in spain now we also have this uh direct foreign investment tool that we should expect some screening from the government and to to a certain extent uh, uh it will be interesting to see if the authority doing a, a, a merger uh, review will somehow interact with the government raising uh, this this issue as well because as we have uh, seen in the in recent uh, times and in the past couple of months the the commission is in fact 
uh, advising all, uh, recommending all member states to adopt screening measures and to, to be uh, alert as regards foreign invest in, in, uh, investment in strategic uh, sectors of, of uh, the economy. So let's see how, how this uh, will evolve. But uh, uh, from a competition perspective, I would say, well, it will be business as usual. The authority will go, uh, will continue its enforcement activity and its merger control review. And I should not expect, uh, regarding this last topic, um, uh, the authority accepting failing firm defense or or uh, or, or other kind of justification uh, to uh, clear uh, a merger that may raise serious competition concerns, uh, and the same will happen as regards enforcement. So, uh, infringement will still be an infringement, and I think they they let uh, they uh, uh, immediately after the EC, ECN. Uh, joint declaration, the Portuguese Competition Authority make it clear an infringement will be treated as an infringement. And I will move, uh, uh, thank you very much. I will uh, hand the floor to my uh, next colleague. So thank you very much for this uh, overview on, on Portugal. I'm uh, Ines Bodenstein from Gleis Lutz, and I will now move on to Germany. So I, I'd like to give you a short competition law outlook uh, uh, for Germany after the, after the COVID uh, crisis. And uh, in my first slide, I, we, we highlighted four aspects that uh, might become relevant in, in these times of crisis. I think, first of all, it's, of course, uh, needless to state that antitrust law is still valid in Germany and it will be strictly enforced uh, by our competition authority, by the uh, FCO. Uh, the, our FCO has emphasized that they are ready for action and that they will intervene if there are uh, types of infringements uh, during the crisis. But maybe let us now shed light on, on certain topics where we think that antitrust law might have become more flexible during the crisis, that antitrust law might have become stricter, or might even give opportunities for undertakings now to use uh, during the crisis. And we have listed four topics here, and this is just a brief overview. I'd like to go into more detail on two of, of these topics later on, this being uh, corporations and the rise of e-commerce. As regards corporations with uh, competitors, uh, we have heard a lot about the statement of the ECN or the European Commission that they will not intervene against certain corporations now in these times of crisis if they are temporary and necessary to avoid supply shortages. And now only a few days old, we have a very interesting application scenario for such corporations in Germany in the automotive industry where the uh, FCO has given uh, a specific guideline how such corporations may work in a, in a compliant uh, environment. Uh, and I think that the question that is in the room is, how can this serve as a model also for other branches? And I will go into this into more detail uh, later on. So the second column that uh, we have put onto this slide is, of course, unilateral conduct and exploitative uh, behavior. I think we are all aware that uh, conduct such as excessive pricing rather had a shadowy existence uh, in, in, in recent years. But now this is uh, becoming an aspect of a competition law where it is becoming stricter, that now in these times of crisis, excessive pricing or supply reductions may amount to an abuse of a dominant position if not objectively justified or uh, applied in a non-discriminatory discriminatory way. And so if you are part of a dominant company, and uh, I think it needs to be, we need to be aware here that dominance has a wider approach during the crisis. So this is not only relevant for undertakings which have been dominant before, but it's even uh, the possible or the case that undertakings have become dominant due to the crisis if they supply products that are now scarce products and so that there's a certain dependency of, uh, of uh, buyers on these products. This could create dominance during the crisis, due to the crisis. And also for these companies, it's important to have a close review now on any changes in the sales strategy. If your operative guys uh, change the prices or change the delivery volumes, that they refuse to supply certain, uh, certain buyers, it's important to have a close view on this to prevent that you get into the fair way of uh, abuse of a dominant position in these times of crisis. And I think this is especially relevant for the health industry or for the food industry, but uh, is also valid for, for various other industries. 
And the third column uh, that we uh, included here is the rise of e-commerce uh, that we are seeing during the, the crisis. Uh, it's obvious that online sales are becoming more and more important uh, with the fact that offline sales were not possible during times of contact restrictions or that consumers are deterred from offline sales uh, if they uh, if they have to wear masks in bricks and motor stores etc so we see that online sales increase and now we think now is the right time for brand manufacturers but also for other industries to review their online sales strategy how they can make best use of the opportunities that antitrust law also provides there to shape their uh, their online uh, business and and support it in these times to face the we have to say it the new normal of e-commerce after the crisis and last but not least, we, we briefly mentioned here the COVID-19 legislation that we, of course, also had in Germany. The review periods for mergers were extended and uh, uh, liability to interest was suspended for a certain period of time, but just to be uh, complete here. So let's now move in more detail to uh, the topic of uh, cooperations between competitors. Uh, as, as already outlined, uh, the authorities have stated, and especially here the ECN or the European Commission, that they will not intervene against uh, corporations with competitors insofar as they are necessary and temporary to avoid a shortage of supply. And uh, the FCO has mentioned that many undertakings have approached them from various branches, that they are open for discussion. But what we lacked until uh, a few days were really specific guidance how to conduct such corporations and what measures to implement to be on the safe side of the law. And now we have this uh, Corona restructuring initiative in the automotive industry where we are now getting this guidance needed. Uh, a German car association is planning to, uh, to set up a sp specific initiative for the restart of the automotive production that is now uh, beginning after the long weeks of, uh, of lockdown. And uh, the car association is planning to have a framework for this restart of the automotive production so that they are planning to uh, have joint information on timing, when which supplier will restart its uh, production, and that they are planning to issue best practices on how how to avoid misallocation of resources in these times of restart. And the second initiative is that they want to implement an efficient restructuring uh, proceedings for struggling suppliers. They want to form stakeholder groups of uh, buyers, uh, OEMs, uh, banks, etc., and that these stakeholder groups can exchange information between them and within these stakeholder groups. This information being kind of uh, loan agreements, supportive measures, operative problems, liquidity, etc. And the FCO listened to the uh, to the suggestion of the German Car Association, and it now publicly stated that it will desist from an in-depth review of this cooperation if certain accompanying measures are uh, are obeyed. And uh, this is quite a long list of uh, accompanying measures that, uh, that they have now to deal uh, with and gives very specific guidance on how to, to conduct such corporations in a compliant way. And these are, among other things, that the information exchange between these stakeholder groups needs to be absolutely necessary for the restructuring. It needs to be limited until December 2020. It's, uh, the information has only to be exchanged in an aggregated format and uh, they, they should build a, a sort of confidentiality ring so that the information is only available to, to a certain people who are maybe not too close to the operative business or if they are, let's say, a, a purchasing manager of the OEMs, that these purchasing managers are prevented from negotiating with the suppliers, with these struggling suppliers for a certain period of time. So these are rather comprehensive accompanying measures that have to be taken to ensure compliance, but they give us very specific guidance on, on which, in which direction to think also uh, for other branches for such corporations. So is this a potential model for other branches? Yes, we think it is, despite all the specifics that we of course have in the automotive industry. So we think there are more of such corporations to come and we can think of uh, the pharma industry or the manufacturing industry in this uh, context. But what, what we want to 
give give here as message is that we would not advise to go down the route of self-assessment as regards such uh, such corporations but rather include competition experts for such corporations let them document the necessity and the temporariness of your uh, corporation and how this is uh, unavoidable to avoid a shortage of supply and then it's also very advisable to co coordinate upfront uh, with the FCO, uh, which is very responsive to these kind of requests in, in these times. So let me come to my to the last topic, the rise of digitals and e-commerce that we are seeing in, uh, in these times. As I have already outlined, there is a strong increase in importance for e-commerce as consumers are deterred from, from buying offline during times of contact restrictions, they are even prevented from buying offline. And so it's all shifting to, to e-commerce and there are already in the, in the figures to be seen a noticeable increase in online business. But we also have to say strongly focused on platforms such as Amazon. And this also leads to our next message that Amazon of course, it has always been uh, been strong and 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 uh, very important on the market, but now it is becoming more and more important, like like a gatekeeper. And this is of course on the radar of the authorities. The FCO is closely monitoring Amazon and uh, has uh, sent questionnaires how they handle supply shortages. And just yesterday, the European Commission uh, opened proceedings against Amazon how they how they use the sensitive data that they receive from their independent and retailers. So Amazon is uh, really in the focus of the authorities uh, as, as platform. So what we would like to give as a message here that now in terms of these crises, we think it's the right time for brand manufacturers, but also for other undertakings to review their online sales strategy, how they can make best use of antitrust uh, opportunities uh, to shape their, their online business. This does not have to be the fully fledged selective distribution system. It can be a kind of smaller type of selective distribution system for certain products, for a premium product line that you want to uh, retain for your own business or for your premium retailers. But even apart from any selective distribution system, it can be a quality criteria for online sales as it has always been allowed by the vertical guidelines to do so. And such quality criteria can give you uh, control back over your over your sales channel and push your own website sales and and retailer sales to not leave the whole field to to uh, the kinds of amazon and with with regard to amazon and the two proceedings that we are seeing here we think it's important to review and document whether you have similar problems with amazon and how you can make use of these pending proceedings to also ease your uh, relationship uh, with uh, amazon so to conclude, we think the two main facts, uh, the, the two important aspects for, for German antitrust law in these times of crisis is that on the one hand, it, it's giving more flexibility as regards corporations uh, with uh, competitors in the framework the, the explained. And on the other hand, it's offering important opportunities to now uh, shape your online sales strategy, which uh, should be made use more than ever in these uh, times of the new normal of e-commerce after. To the crisis. So thank you very much and I will hand over to the to our last jurisdiction to France, our colleagues from uh, Gide, Franck Audran and uh, Ségolène Pessy. Hello to, to everyone. Um, uh, thank you for 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 the last presentation uh, regarding France. Uh, before before letting the floor to to Sebastian, my colleague, I just would like to to focus, as it was the case in Germany, on um, um, some some news in France regarding uh, the rise of e-commerce. Because um, of course, the French Competition Authority has been very active during the lockdown period. But at the end of this lockdown period, the French Competition Authority issued a report on digital business and also online sales. So I think that this topic will uh, pop up in every jurisdiction and maybe in the coming months at com com commission level, EU level. But uh, what we noted uh, after this lockdown period is that uh, all economic players uh, faces 
face a significant rise of e-commerce. So the FCA, the French Commission Authority, take the opportunity to make a kind of state of play of their decisional practice regarding this. Uh, notably, the French Commission Authority uh, made a focus in this study on the substitutability between offline and online. And she um, it presented um, economic assessment how, on how to take into account uh, online sales when you are assessing off, offline sales. So this is very interesting because it is gathering all the economic tests that they have made in the last uh, months, years, where the French Commission Authority had to assess a lot of economic uh, cases, a lot of major control cases, but also antitrust cases regarding this interaction between online and offline sales. Another thing is what is which is interesting is what the French Competition Authority calls the Fugital. Because the Competition Authority noted that online and offline sales are more and more integrated. And it noted also the possibility, for instance, to order online but in a physical shops. And she not, it noted also the click and collect possibilities that was reducing the absence of substitutability between offline and online. What is a little bit disappointing in this study it is that the French Commission Authority um, is going again on dual pricing on some vertical restraints, especially dual pricing, uh, the ban of uh, price comparison tool, but without taking a clear opinion on this kind of vertical restraints. And what we know is that it will be a topic that will be debated and um, discussed at EU level between the different national authorities. But what we would like uh, is that the French Commission Authority, which is following um, very often the, the Commission, but uh, push a little bit forward its own decisional practice and give more flexibility, for instance, to brand owners. Because the French Commission Authority, for instance, it noted that there was no investigation regarding dual prices, and it's, it is still a vertical restraint that could be considered as hardcore. So the French Competition Authority is trying to, to make its own assessment of its own decisional practice, but without you know, breaking the rules and take, uh, taking some um, positions. Regarding the activity of the French Competition Authority during the lockdown period, what you have to know and thank, enfin, we have to thank it for that. It is uh, starting from the beginning, it put in place a specific platform regarding to COVID and a specific team, as far as I know. And the French Competition Authority has published two cases where they, they, they were involved during the lockdown period. There was the first case regarding um, a professional association uh, which was gathering retailers and which uh, wanted to negotiate as a group, do you know, commercial lease with uh, some lessors. It was one of the big topics during the lockdown period, or to allow small companies to negotiate commercial lease, commercial rentals with large, do you know, lessors. Because of course, during two or three months, physical stores did not have any business, and they had to support the same level of run commercial rents. The authority take a position favorable to this trade association. We wanted to negotiate with the, the large lesser of the market, and accept that they move forward together against against, but in cooperation with, but against also. The, the the large lessors of the of the market so it was a very pragmatic approach and i think a good one another case is also in the very beginning of the lockdown period what do you know the case regarding medical device and in particularly regarding restriction to distribution and to importation of medical devices in some french overseas territories so um, the French Commission Authority was warned about some restrictions put in place by, you know, large 
company regarding this kind of territories that are very specific, but very under, under the radar and the scope of the French Competition Authority. And the French Competition Authority reacted in one week and sent questionnaire to, to this company. And such company was also putting in place restrictions regarding medical device, changed his behavior very fast. So what we can say is that uh, enforcement of the French Competition Competition Authority was very efficient in such a period. Um, what will be next? Uh, what we see now, but these cases are not public, but what we can see on the market is that even if the things are going quite well since the, the last day of the lockdown period, some of uh, some large group are facing, you know, some financial difficulties. So they could uh, move to uh, some aggressive behaviors uh, in the coming weeks and months. And I am sure that, uh, and I know some of them, the French Commission Authority will have to issue and to regulate the market in order to reduce this kind of aggressive behaviors that can rise up in difficult contexts. So now I will let the floor to, to Ségolène, which will speak about the filling, filling the approach of the French Competition Authority regarding filling firm theory. Ségolène. Yes, thank you, Franck, and good morning, everybody. Um, I will complement uh, the presentation of Franck with, with a few uh, words on uh, the, the approach of the French Competition Authority towards the failing firm defense and whether we uh, can uh, um, see a move um, in the context of the, of the COVID and, and the, the difficulties that uh, companies will be will be facing and uh, I thought interesting to, to share with you um, our experience uh, in an uh, important case for the, for the French Competition Authority uh, last year, which was uh, the Coffee Geo William Sorin uh, case in the ready meal uh, sector and uh, which can, can provide uh, uh, useful uh, guidance in this respect. So, so far, uh, the French uh, Competition Authority has very uh, rarely used the, the failing firm defense and accepted it. Uh, there are only a few uh, applications of, of this uh, defense. Um, th there are three uh, strict conditions, which are first, uh, that the targets uh, would in the near future uh, have been forced to, to, to leave and to exit the market. The second condition is that the, the, there is no less anti-competitive alternative uh, than the notified merger. And the, the third um, condition is that absent the merger, um, the assets of the failing firm would, would have exited the market. So this is a prospective uh, analysis. Um, the, the advantage, of course, of this defense is that even if uh, the transaction raises uh, complex competition issues, it allows the, 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 the competition authority uh, to clear it uh, without commitments. Um, so the last example of uh, the, the analysis by the FCA of, of this, uh, of this uh, uh, failing firm defense was in the, the Cofigeo William Sorin case uh, we, we dealt with uh, last year. Um, it concerned so the, the ready meal uh, sector, which was uh, a sector uh, affected by, by the, the, the food crisis, uh, the fact that there was less demand for, for those types uh, of, of products and also the fact that uh, the, the, the target, uh, William Sorin, uh, was affected by uh, frauds and uh, was in a very uh, difficult situation. Um, uh, and uh, actually the, the production uh, in, uh, had uh, stopped. Um, so there, there was prior to, to the, the merger process, and the, the acquisition by uh, proposed acquisition by by Cofigeo, the, the acquirer, there were already a state interven intervention to uh, to to help uh, the, the companies survive. 
Um, so we, we had to, to uh, request a derogation to the French Competition Authority and, uh, and the, the, we, we started uh, the, the merger review. Um, the analysis of the French Competition Authority in that case was that uh, even uh, if uh, the, 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 the sector was, um, was in crisis and, and the, the target in difficulties, uh, the combined market share of the parties was very uh, high on some uh, segments and the, 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 there were uh, risks of uh, unilateral effects and uh, of uh, um, increase of, of uh, price which could not be uh, compensated by uh, the, the strong power of, of clients in, in the sectors. So with that in mind, we, we had actually two possible approach. Uh, the first one was the failing firm defense, uh, which as indicated uh, is um, uh, strictly applied by the DFCA. And the second one, uh, uh, more in, in innovative, was the, the phase three, um, so this is what we call the right of evocation. I think it also exists in Germany, for example, and it is uh, the possibility for the Minister of Economy to override, to rule out actually a decision from the, the French Competition Authority for other grounds than, than competition law, such as uh, industrial development, uh, competitiveness of, of the companies, or uh, the, the creation or maintenance of, uh, of employment. Uh, so it allows the Minister of, of Economy to, to have uh, the final say of a transaction and actually replace the decision of the FCA, which would, for example, clear with uh, um, injunctions or even uh, prohibit. Um, and uh, this uh, phase three or right of evocation had never been used uh, in the in the past uh, by 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 the by the minister. So um, here uh, the, the the French Competition Authority uh, did not uh, did not accept uh, the, the the exception of the the, the failing firm defense because there were other. Um, uh, offers uh, according to it that were uh, that were provided, and so uh, it considered that uh, the, the 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 failing firm defense could not apply. So uh, it uh, the the FCA uh, actually cleared the the transaction, but with uh, injunctions for uh, William Sorin um, to uh, and for the parties to sell a brand and uh, also to sell a production uh, site, which, uh, which rendered the, the transaction uh, not uh, any more interesting for, for, for our clients. Um, and so because of the, the, the contacts and, and prior uh, um, uh, work we, we had done on, on, that, uh, on that basis, on the same uh, day, the French Competition Authority actually uh, issued its decision of uh, uh, clearance with injunctions, the, the Minister of Economy announced that uh, it would uh, evoke and, uh, and adopt a, a decision uh, authorizing the transaction subject to commitments which were not competition based but uh, on the preserva preservation of employment and also on uh, innovation. So um, to, 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 to conclude on, on, on this uh, on this case and what we can expect um, after the, the, the COVID uh, for companies, um, we, we think that uh, the, the, the FCA uh, could uh, continue to have a strict approach of the failing firm defense. And uh, there is actually no uh, sign that it would uh, inflict uh, um, or um, uh, loosen its, uh, its analysis of, of this defense. But uh, the phase uh, three uh, could uh, could be uh, an alternative uh, for 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 the fu for the future. Um, so now I will leave uh, some time for for the Q and A uh, session, and I thank you. Thank you, Sigolène. I think we have received uh, a few questions uh, in this uh, presentation. We will now ask them. Uh,
and uh, you will proceed just in the same order than you follow for the presentation. If you have sent some question and this question has not been picked up, and if you wish to send other question afterwards, don't panic because we will send the recording of the presentation to you and you will be more than welcome to think it over and to reach out to us afterwards. So first, coming to Italy, the first question goes like this. We, we heard that the Italian Competition Authority in this last period relied on an inno innovative reading of antitrust provision. Do you think that this behavior is due to the emergency situation or is it going to last? Well, I think that this behavior is going to last because the Italian authority is very eager to play the role of innovator and it already did so in the recent and normal, meaning not pandemic past, by resurrecting the excessive pricing abuse in the Aspen case. Furthermore, this approach, this very same approach, had been followed by other national authorities and even by the EU Commission. This shows that this strive for novelty, this willingness to be creative, in applying competition law is not merely an Italian thing, but seems to me to be a shared feeling among enforcers. Think about the Bundeskartellamt decision in the Facebook case and the very recent EU Commission consultation for a new competition tool. These are, to me, definitely apples of the same tree. I'll leave to Giacomo for the next question. Um, thank you, Patrick. Um, so I got a question concerning the in this, I will be a case that I mentioned during my presentation. In this case, the authority showed a particularly and somehow unprecedented aggressive attitude in merger control. In your, in your views, what are the reasons behind such behavior? Um, I'll try to be extremely short. The first reason I think is clearly the importance of the case at hand, which involves every possible sub-segmentation of the broader banking market, banking relevant market and which involves two major players, um, not only the main Italian banking group, but also a player that according to the authority has the potential to become over the next few years, the third main Italian banking group. So clearly this is the most evident and apparent reason. The second reason instead I think relates more to some structural shortcoming, shortcomings of Italian merger control rules most notably the fact that there is no standstill obligation. And I believe that in this case, the ICA is trying to learn from its recent mistakes in which it basically opened the phase to reviews while the, after the parties had already closed the transaction. So it is now trying to come at this transaction with every weapon it has got in order to not find itself unscrambling the egg at a later stage. Uh, that is all on my side. I don't know if Maria has some questions concerning Spain and I will be glad to leave the floor to her. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I will do the same than my colleagues, uh, Italian colleagues, and uh, I selected one of the questions, but I will be, of course, very happy to reply to uh, all the other questions uh, by email. So uh, the, the question I, I, I picked is, uh, will the Spanish Competition Authority take into account the COVID-19 crisis when deciding on the imposition of fines for anti-competitive conduct? Now, this is a question uh, that, that we get a lot, and uh, unfortunately, the answer is no. Uh, we don't believe that the CMC will consider the, the crisis as a, as a mitigating factor. And in fact, quite the opposite. It may very well be that if the alleged uh, uh, conduct concern any of the sectors uh, particularly affected by the crisis, such as sanitary products, insurance, funeral uh, services, or even financial services, it, it could uh, very well be that the authority will consider that there is even an aggravi aggravating factor and increase uh, the fines imposed on this account. This is uh, what happened during the 2008 uh, financial, financial crisis uh, when the, uh, uh, the CNC, the predecessor of the uh, current uh, authority, systematically rejected that the crisis uh, was a justification for an exemption or a mitigating factor for the fine. 
And, and finally, and, and I will leave it there, let's not forget that the fines are not the only consequence uh, uh, potentially uh, facing uh, by the companies. Uh, they are other even uh, more harmful, such as, for example, the ban uh, on public contracting uh, up to three years that I had mentioned before. And with, with this, as I said, uh, I leave it to, for other colleagues to answer other questions. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. The, the The question would be: Should we should we expect bond raids in the near future in Portugal? And the answer is clearly yes, we should. So, uh, as as everyone is saying, and uh, we just heard about Spain, we don't expect uh, the COVID pandemic to be a mitigating factor or the authority to slow down its enforcement activity. And and uh, but there is a a small issue that is very interesting: is that in Portugal and this doesn't happen in other jurisdictions, the authority conducts an on-site preliminary review. So usually they spend one to two weeks within the, the company premises to conduct the down rate. And the reason, the main reason for this is that they cannot seize unready mail. So this, this is, is uh, almost unique uh, uh, across uh, many jurisdictions. But but it is the case in Portugal. That is why they spend some so much time in a company. So, uh, how, how will will they conduct uh, down raids in the near future? The same way. So, will they spend one or two weeks uh, in a company? Well, we somehow have have the concern that because of this COVID nineteen context, the authority could uh, 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 take a different approach and seize and collect everything uh, uh, they they can from the very beginning for a, a later assessment actually this is the maybe the new trend after ecn plus uh, being uh, uh, transposed to to each member state uh, legislation because of, of the new enforcement powers that the authorities will have and in this case that this may in fact be the the new trend so our concern is that uh, we will not have less down rates but we somehow must be concerned about the defense rights of, of, uh, of companies during the down rate, especially in what concerns unready mild privilege uh, information uh, 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 because of this. So uh, that would be uh, our recommendation would be uh, stay alert, uh, uh, keep, keep uh, 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 looking and, uh, at uh, any possible infringement. Uh, and expect future down rates. And I will uh, pass uh, to next colleague. Thank you. So I will take over for uh, Germany. Uh, as I understand, we have not yet uh, received specific questions for Germany or for France, but I do very much hope that we are going to receive them now. So please feel free to, to email us, to, to chat with us, to send us a mes message. We are, of course, very happy to, to answer all the questions that you might have uh, on these uh, topics. And in light of the timing, I would now also like to conclude this uh, session in the name of all these uh, participants from from Gide, Chiumenti, Quattro Casas uh, and, uh, and, and Gleis Lutz. And uh, thank you very much to all of you for staying with us uh, with this uh, challenging topic. So thank you and goodbye from our side.